interesting book. I've had a fun time preparing for this one. This is called the Book of Revelation. This is a revealing of how things, as they, as they really are. This is the reality of the spiritual dimension, the spiritual part of our world being revealed to us. It's an apocalyptic book, and that might sound really weird. Last week I spoke about what this meant, and that it's a genre of strange, wild, imaginative, symbolic things that are really hard to interpret, that people have interpreted all different ways all throughout history, but it's actually a book of encouragement. If you're a one or you're a two this morning, this actually, this book's to encourage you, to say, hey, I can see where you're at. Jesus sees where you're at and He is with you. So today we're getting into some, well, wild, weird stuff. We've got animals with eyes under their wings and a whole lot of strange things happening today. Because today is actually like a, a revealing of the throne room of heaven. If you've ever wanted to sneak behind the scenes, here it is. Um, about um, 15 years ago, I was in LA. I was actually in Hollywood of all places. I was staying in a hotel in Hollywood and and I walked out of my, of my Hollywood hotel in the morning one morning, and I saw a crazy scene. It was, oh, like, I couldn't get my head around it. it. There was police cars everywhere, and there was, like, crowds everywhere, and, and there was sirens going, and there's all this noise, and then I actually heard explosions, and there was, like, security people all pushing crowds away, people kind of gathering at, like, barriers, trying to get in, having a look what's going on. And I walked out, and I'm like, what has happened like, this is, this is America, I'm like a scared Australian, I'm like, <gasps> guns, explosions, terrorist attack, like, what is going on here? So I'm watching for about five, ten minutes, and then I hear this, and cut. <laughs> Literally on a megaphone, and the whole thing stops. I'd actually walked into a movie set. Now, there, you know, I was one of those people trying to have a look. It was actually Will Smith, and I actually saw Will Smith on the side, and I walked up to him. No one was, no one was around him, and I thought, oh, I'm going to get to meet Will Smith. And I walked up to him, and he turned around, and it was Will Smith's stunt double. <laughs> it completely had the wrong face. I'm like, oh, okay. I got a photo with him anyway. No one will know. Revelation is an and cut moment. And the, and, and the verse we're going to look at today is that, hey, it looks chaotic. It looks like the world is exploding. It looks like things are getting crazy. It looks like there's police cars everywhere. But there's actually a director in charge of the whole thing that knows exactly what's going on. And it might look chaotic, but he's been there the entire time making sure it goes the way and heads the direction that he wants because he's the director. So it's Revelation 4 we're in today. Revelation 2 and 3. Yeah, Revelation 1 last week. You can check it out on YouTube if you missed last week. Revelation 2 and 3 are letters to the church. I've preached on those letters a few times, so I'm going to skip the letters. They're, they're brilliant letters. They're really challenging letters to the church. I encourage you to read them. But we're in Revelation 4 today. And John, who wrote the book, says this. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I'd first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. There's a, a door opens. And it's not a door like in the sky into some other like, okay, that's up to heaven. It's a door to heaven that's actually a door to a different dimension that's happening right now. See, there's, the Bible talks about two dimensions. There's the kingdom of God, where God reigns and where God is in control, where everything God wants to happen is happening. And there's actually the kingdom of earth, where, where there's rebellion and there's evil and there's sin. And we're taught as Christians to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So it's not like heaven is just a place we're going to get to one day. It's like heaven's happening right now. There is another dimension we can't see right now. And actually, that dimension is breaking into our dimension. It's, in, it's like intergalactic multiverse stuff. The Bible's awesome. Like, like, this is actually the dimension of God breaking in to ours. And a little door opens. I've got a picture here of a door opening. 
And there's a voice saying, come check it out. Come for a behind-the-scenes look at how things really are in heaven. So if you've ever wanted a behind-the-scenes look, you know, like behind-the-scenes is so interesting. How does this really work? What's actually happening here? We love it. This is, this is the best behind-the-scenes thing you could ever have. This is behind-the-scenes of the universe. Just come on in. Everyone, everyone knows, you might not even be a Christian here today, but everyone knows there's like a different dimension well, most people, like they can just sense. I was actually talking to a guy a few weeks ago. He's not a Christian guy. And I was like, oh, I'm a pastor. And as soon as I said that to anyone, and that's the classic Aussie question. Hey, mate, how you going? What do you do? And I've got this in straight away to talk about God. I go, I'm a pastor. And they're like, oh. And usually the eyebrows shoot straight up. And some, sometimes they go, oh, sorry for swearing before. I'm like, that's okay, man, all good. And said, so, oh, actually, my, um, my, my neighbor's mum's um, gardener used to go to church. Well, I, went to, I went to church as a, in, when I was in primary school. You know, I went to mass and I, well, so I got christened as a baby. It's really good. It just opens up real conversation. And I was talking to this one guy and he just said, there just has to be more to life than this. I know there's something out there. And most, that, that's what most Aussies are. Most Aussies aren't like atheists thinking, oh, this definitely, it's just, it's just what you can see. Most people know there's more than meets the eye. And we get a revelation and behind the scenes, look, John says, and at once I was in the Spirit. He's giving like a real spiritual encounter. You might have had an encounter like this before. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had an appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Now, this is strange language. Like, this is like John the Apostle getting a vision, an incredible overwhelming experience, and then going back later and trying to write down what he saw. And it's like, he's like, what is the most shiny, incredible, expensive, spectacular thing that I can think of? It's like emeralds and rubies. How does a rainbow shine like an emerald? I've got no idea. That doesn't make any sense. This is him just trying to to say, this is brilliant. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. And they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Something incredibly powerful is going on here. And in front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. Remember, seven, if you were here last week, we talked about seven means perfect. These are the seven spirits of God, or the sevenfold spirit of God, the perfect Holy Spirit of God. You can tell John's almost struggling to describe this. It was such a spectacular, wondrous experience. I've, I've seen the Grand Canyon, all right, in America. I remember I got home from America, and someone was like, what's the Grand Canyon like? I'm like, big, (laughs) grand, I don't know, like it's lots of rocks and it's a big chasm. Did I do it justice? (laughs) Like it's like, it's like, how do I, how do you describe being in the throne room of heaven? How do you put that into language? It's huge. It's weird. We've got these 20, we've got this giant big throne in the middle with someone sitting on it who you can barely look at. And then you've got other thrones around the side. You've got 24. Now, there's a lot of numbers in, in the Revelation, a lot of symbols. So 24 means the double 12, and 12 means fullness of all of God's people. So it's like some people say it's the 12 tribes of Israel, and it's the 12 apostles. It's all the people that should be there in heaven are there. Those that have chosen God and those that God has chosen. Everyone's there. It's an encouragement to a small church. It's really struggling in a big world. Everyone's there, and God is there. And then it gets a bit weirder. We're introduced to four strange beasts, characters, creatures. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings and were covered with eyes all around, even under the wings. 
And day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Again, symbolic, strange language. Creatures that kind of have a face like a human or an eagle. There's some people have tried to put this into like, I think this is AI generated revelation art. I've been down a lot of rabbit holes, just so you know, the last few weeks preparing for revelation. I've been down, I mean, I, you come and talk to me after. I, I could do a whole podcast on the weird and wacky parts of revelation. And some of it's probably true, I don't know. But, but here's someone trying their best. And I bet if John was here and I was like, hey, John, what do you reckon of that? He'd be like, nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just so you know, nothing like that, the opposite of that, okay? It's, it's, it's I, I, I can't describe it. And, it's for, and, 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 it, and I think it's trying to say, and everyone's got a different opinion, but I think it's trying to say, all of God's people are worshipping God, good, and all of creation is worshipping God. You've got the lion, which represents all the wild beasts, you know, lion king of the jungle. You've got the ox, which represents all the tame beasts that the humans have tamed. You've got the eagle representing all the flying beasts that they can see. And you've got the human representing the, the, the creatures that have been made in the image of God, which is us. We're creatures too, along with the rest. And they're all worshipping God. And friends, here is the big message of Revelation 4. Everything is fine. That's the message. God is where he should be. He's on the throne. Humans are where they should be, those that have chosen God. They're around it. They're now reigning on a throne next to him. It says in the, at the end of Revelation 4, they're, they're, they're worshipping him and they're casting their crowns before him. It says in the Bible that when you get to heaven, you get given a crown. And then it's interesting, as soon as you get the crown, you go and just throw it back at Jesus, throw it back at the Father and say, it's all yours, God. It was all yours anyway. Everything's fine. In fact, all of creation is worshipping God. And this is written in the present tense in the language. So it's actually happening right now. This is not just a glimpse of one day, although I do think it's a glimpse of one day. It's a glimpse of, in the heavenly realm right now, everything is fine. You might need to hear that today. The early church had to hear that. It's like, look, it might seem like everyone's worshipping Caesar. It might seem like evil is winning and the Romans keep doing everything they can to crucify you and hurt you and, and persecute you. And it may seem, like even in our culture, it may seem like God is being mocked. It may seem like everything's getting worse. It may seem like God's not in control. But then we get, and cut. It's like, oh, everything's fine in heaven. Everything's fine. Revelation's got a lot of spiritual battle. You'll see that very soon. Lots of judgment and, and, and like evil being confronted and literal fights. Like there's a fight uh, in Revelation 12 between Michael the archangel and the dragon. They should make a movie about that. It's like angel versus dragon fight. It's a big battle. It sounds amazing. In Revelation 16, we've got the battle of Armageddon. This huge big battle on the plains. There's a lot of spiritual warfare and fighting in Revelation. But it doesn't start like that. It starts with the reality that God is sitting down. In fact, God doesn't need to fight a battle because God is winning. <laughs> God is on the throne. God actually never fights wars. He doesn't have to. He just sits there and gets worship and gets praise. It's not a fair fight. He's trying to say to these churches and saying to us today, Yes, it might feel like a spiritual battle, and that's important, and we're going to get to that. But to start with, it's not a fair fight. It's just God on his throne. I love that when Jesus came, God in the flesh, there was all the, this is big storm happening, and he's on a boat with his disciples, and he just goes and takes a nap. He's like, you can take a nap in the middle of the chaos, because God is on the throne. And maybe you just need to hear that today. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. God is not worried. He never has been worried. God knows what's going to happen. God's not fighting a war. He's already won the war. 
Everything's fine. Can we just take a deep breath in? Deep breath out. I could finish this message right here. I can tell some of you want me to, okay? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> yes, a 12-minute one. Yes, we're winning. Literally, I could finish it right now because that is a beautiful truth. But there's an elephant in the room. Maybe you can think, well, what's the elephant in the room right now? When I'm t- trying to say everything is fine. There's a problem. And anyone who's experienced this thing called life knows there's a problem. What's the problem? It's, it, it's easy for me to say, everything's fine, just worship God. That's what Revelation 4 says. Everything's fine, you just worship God, everything's fine. But the world's not fine, is it? The world's messed up. The world's in pain. The world's hurting. People are hurting each other. People are hurting you, maybe in this room this morning. Maybe you are hurting people. I reckon you might be this morning. There's wars. There's famine. The worship seemingly is not going the right way. So we were created, Revelation 4, to worship God, and yet we decide to worship the good things He gave us instead. So instead of worshiping God, we worship His gifts. And when you worship His gifts, the world, it just goes haywire. And we decide, no, no, God, I know you think you know what's good, but I'm actually going to decide for myself what's good. And I think, you know, I don't need you telling me what to do. I think I can live my life and just work out what's good. I can decide. And it's broken the world. We worship all sorts of weird things. We worship money. We worship money. It's a capitalist society. Money is the default God of our time. We worship money to the point where some have so much They don't know what to do with it, literally. They just think, let's just get more. And others have so little that they're starving to death. Like That's what happens when you worship the wrong thing. What else do we worship? Have a think in our culture. What's the false worship of Babylon, as Revelation would say, in our Babylon? I reckon beauty, aesthetic looks... We worship beauty to the point where basically everyone I speak to feels inadequate about their looks. I don't know. I don't think there's many people that look in the mirror this morning and we're like, yep, killing it again. (laughs) Crushing it, tiger. Uh, Maybe a few of you. I can see you. You you do look good, admittedly. But we worship worship beauty on such a point where it, it actually really hurts us. And every day... We feel inadequate and, and in pain and we feel like we've got to change and we feel like we're not good enough. And it's not, it's, not, it's not just a yuck feeling, it's actually death itself. It actually is depression. It actually is eating disorders. I talked to Steph, she's a school counsellor in this school and she sees young people killing themselves, literally, by not eating because they've got such evil, demonic dysmorphia happening. And it's because we're worshipping beauty. We worship fashion. We have this fast fashion cycle that's destroying our environment because everyone's just grabbing clothes and, oh, it's not cool anymore, throw it out. And they end up in other countries in landfill. We worship freedom. Freedom's a brilliant thing. I love freedom. Jesus came to set us free, but we worship freedom as if individual freedom is the biggest, the biggest thing we could ever do, biggest truth there ever is. We worship freedom. To the point, well, that's the original sin, thinking, no, I'm free to do whatever I want and throw God out of the equation. We throw God out of the order of creation. We throw order out of gender and families are broken up. We think we're free. Sexual freedom is so important. Most men in Australia are addicted to porn, watching at least twice a week. Sexual freedom is even so important And this is not said in any way judgmental, this is just a truth. But sexual freedom is so important to us that we're happy to murder the unborn. And it's just sad. And it's it's agony. And it's because worship has gone wrong. Everything's fine? I don't know. Maybe in heaven, but not here. How's it going to be fine here? 
I could go on, guys. Hatred, murder, war, selfishness, evil, sin. And here's the part that breaks my heart the most, if I'm honest, is that there's a whole lot of evil in the world that I see, but then I see it in myself as well. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that hard to swallow? When you see evil in the world, and you actually, I can be selfish, and I can worship the wrong thing, and I can hurt my family. I can hurt those around me. And I can hurt the environment and God's creation. Who's going to fix it? How are we going to get this whole thing back on track? What's the plan? That's what everyone's thinking about. What's the plan? Everyone's got a plan. What's my plan? The other day, Joey, he's five years old. He's my son. And he was, he was showing me he could pour milk now. And, and he's actually pretty good at pouring milk. But, it, but we bought one of those big three-liter ones. And I'm fairly certain they weigh more than Joey weighs. <laughs> so he, he's sitting there with this three-liter, like, Dad, look. I'm like, um, okay, like, independence is important as a parent. I've been taught that recently. Let the kid do it. Don't try and always fix it and help. And he's like, I'm going to do it. And as he's pouring, the cup goes, dunk. It's like, dunk, dunk, dunk. It's just like glugging onto, like, a cup, just going everywhere. And I'm not jumping in. I'm like, whoopsies. And he puts it back. And he looks at it and goes up and goes, whoopsies. And I'm like, all right, what am I going to do here? Don't jump in. I'm like, what's the plan, Joey? What's the plan? And he looks at me and he goes, get a towel. <laughs> That's good, man. Get a towel. Let's do this. Let's fix it. And trying to watch a five-year-old fix it is agonizing. It's just agonizing seeing he's like, he's putting more milk. There's milk everywhere now. My whole kitchen is just milk. He's just pushing it, the milk around. It's like, what are you, what's the plan? What's the plan? That's Revelation 5. Here's where I kind of want to land today. Revelation 5 is the plan. It finally addresses the elephant in the room. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, this is God, God the Father, with a He's got something in the right hand on his on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. So seven means perfection. This is God's perfect plan. It's been in his hand from the beginning. He's not surprised. He knew how things were going to go down. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll and enact the plan? That's what he's saying. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And John says in verse 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And this is the experience of humanity. Who is worthy to fix the problem? Is it the politicians? I think there's some great politicians and there's some really bad politicians. But tell you what, they're not the answer, are they? <laughs> Aussies, we know that. We vote someone in within three weeks. Ah, idiots. Get rid of them. Ah. What's the plan? How are we going to fix it? It's always the government. Oh, the government should do something about that. We should, we should make a rule. We should legislate that. I don't think the government's good. God's put that in place for reasons. That's not the answer. Or maybe it's the education system. Make the teachers teach it. I've heard that a few times, all the teachers in the room. No, you've got, you've got so much room in the curriculum for more stuff to fix our kids. Come on, just squash it in there. Get the teachers to do it. Don't think so. Even though we've got some brilliant teachers. Parents? Parents need to do it. Goodness. Because <laughs> they're not busy either. And all of those guys have a role. But we can't do it. Joey can't fix the milk. It's impossible. And it takes a humble, realistic person to go. This might be you today. Maybe you're not really used to church, but it takes a humble, realistic person to go, I can't do it. We're constantly saying, who's worthy? And it, it leads to a weeping. John's weeping. He's looking around going, who's going to... No one can do this. It's a complicated problem. It's very complicated it's very complex it's not easy to fix the world there's sin and there's evil 
And God actually said, here's the extra complicated part. The guys originally reading this would have known the Old Testament. God has said a human has to fix it. Because God said, I'm going to always work through humans. You know, whenever you're praying for a miracle, often you are the miracle. Because God's like, I'm going to use humans to do my work. In fact, in Genesis 3, he promised that the snake's head, the serpent, the dragon's head is going to be crushed by an offspring of Eve, by a human. Which human is worthy to fix the problem? One of the elders said to me, this is verse 5, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And all the Jewish people would know, what is the root of David and the lion of Judah? That doesn't mean much to us, maybe. But that is, that is the Messiah. That is, in Greek, it's the Christ, the anointed one. The one who will come, the king who will come and beat the enemies. The powerful king that will destroy all the evil people. And only the good people will be left. And so John looks for the lion. He says, see, it's a lion. Look, John, it's a lion of Judah. And he looks for the lion. And what does he see? Where's the lion? He doesn't see it. This is really confusing. Look at the lion. See, the lion. And then I saw a what? A lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. What? Encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, the lamb had seven horns, seven eyes. Horn means power, so seven horns, all the power. And eye means knowledge, and all the knowledge, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, his Holy Spirit. He went out and took the scroll from the right hand of the man who sat on the throne. How come when John looks for the lion, he sees a lamb? He sees a crucified Jesus. You look for the powerful Jesus and you see a crucified Jesus. This is why there's only one who is worthy to take the scroll, to enact the plan. There's only one. Because we have, a, we, have, we have a problem of evil, and then we have a problem within the problem. All right? Stay with me here for a moment. There's a problem of evil, and then there's a problem within the problem, which is that it's actually humans doing the evil. So you've actually got this thing where God is trying to destroy everything that stands against his beloved humanity. But what stands against his beloved humanity? His beloved humanity. <laughs> What do you do then when the very thing standing against the one you love is the one that you love? It's very complex. Anyone here who's ever had much to do with someone, or maybe you've had this in your own life, that's been through substance addiction, an addiction to drugs or alcohol or something like that, you know it's an incredibly painful, complex thing because you hate the addiction, but you love the person. And sometimes the person hates the addiction too. And they love you, but they love the addiction more. They actually love it. They've actually, as much as they hate it, as much as they're trapped inside of it, they actually also want it. It's got a place in their heart. What what happens, happens to me in my house all the time. What happens when the ones standing against my children are my children? (laughs) You ever had a fight in your house? Maybe growing up, you used to fight your siblings. What happens in that situation when the very people that are hurting my kids are my kids? I've got to enact justice. Of course I do. We know. We've got to have justice. There's got to be consequences. What kind of dad would I be if I was like, uh, all good, I just love you guys. He just punched me. Yeah, but I love you both so much. It's like, that's not helpful in this moment. We need consequences. We need justice. So what does God do? What does Jesus, the God-man, do? There's a reason the lamb is slain. And it's a picture of the Passover lamb that was slain so Israel could be free of Egypt. There's a reason the Messiah is on the cross. Because God declares 
God declares, I will deal with the consequences of your evil myself. I will take them on to me. I will take the consequences of your sin and evil away. And where do they go? They have to go somewhere on to me. John the Baptist, which is Jesus' cousin, once said, recorded by John the Apostle, the same John who wrote Revelation, he once saw Jesus and he nudged his followers and he looked over and he said, look, look, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And his followers were probably like, no, it's not, it's a bloke. <laughs> that's not a lamb, John. <laughs> There's only one who is worthy. It's the God-man. Guys, this is the incredible good news of God's plan. John doesn't say, hey, look, there's the Lamb of God who's got a great three-step process that you can enact to help you change your life. Look, there's the Lamb of God. If you just add Him in, you'll find your life will get a whole lot better. No. He says He is going to do the work. He is the Lamb of God come to take away the evil, the pain, the consequences, the sin. See, every other way of doing life, every religion or like worldview, it basically says there's a big problem and you can fix the big problem if you just do a few things. You can fix it if you just do this. You can just pray more, you can be better, you can crusade more. And, you know, really good things. You can just do this and then it'll fix the problem. Jesus never says that. He says, I'm here to fix the problem. Everyone else hands you the scroll. Hey, here's the scroll. Anyone here feeling the crushing pressure of the scroll this morning? Here's the scroll. Good luck. Jesus takes the scroll out of your hand. Jesus never says, shame on you. That's what the world says to us. Oh, you didn't fix it? You didn't do it? You couldn't get it right? Shame on you. Jesus never says, shame on you. He says, shame off you, onto me. Friends, is that good news? <laughs> shame off you and onto me. And he takes it to the cross and he dies. He is the lamb who was slain. He takes the scroll and he shows that God's way of fixing the world is not the way that we often use. Our way is to get angry and to be blaming and to be critical and to be condemning and to be outraged. And God shows us the way to change the world is mercy sacrifice, forgiveness, and love. And that's what he does. He takes the scroll. The lion becomes the lamb. Who else is worthy? What do you do with a God like that? And when he had taken it, this is verse 8, Revelation 5, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. And each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people rising up. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with, the, with your blood you purchased for God, and, and, and this is us here, persons from every tribe and language and people and nation, and this is the important part. This is why God takes you as you are, but he never wants to leave you as you are. Because you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. He doesn't just say, you're forgiven now, now wait around for heaven. You're done. He says, no, no, no. You're forgiven. Now let's get to work. The whole fixing project, that was never on you. That was on me. But come along and I will show you how to do it with me. Come along and bring the kingdom of heaven 
peace, shalom, goodness, love, the fruit of the Spirit, bring this into earth. And the only way is with the worthy one, Jesus Christ. Everything is all right. Everything is fine. Evil is being dealt with. We get to reign on the throne with God, purchased by the blood of the Lamb. I reckon Revelations 4 and 5, guys, are two of the best chapters in the entire Bible. (laughs) A a behind-the-scenes look at how things really are. So would you stand up with me and respond to God this morning? Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did and you want more LifePoint content, subscribe to our channel right now. Or if you're in the area around Morton Bay or Rothwell, head to our service. Sunday, we'd love to see you there. LifePoint.org.au for all the details. We'll see you soon.